In this session, I'm going to deal with the histology of the lymphatic tissue. Before dealing with the histology, let's uh, classify the lymphatic organs and tissues. There are primary lymphatic organs that provide environment for stem cells to divide and mature. And uh, these uh, divide and mature into B and T lymphocytes. The primary lymphatic organs are the red bone marrow. Actually, the red bone marrow give rise to both T and B lymphocytes, but the B lymphocytes, they uh, mature in the red bone marrow, while the T lymphocytes, they have to migrate to the thymus gland to become mature. So both the red bone marrow and the thymus are primary lymphatic organs. A secondary lymphatic organ or tissue is the site where immune responses occur. There is multiplication of lymphocytes, but there is no maturation of lymphocytes, and these can be subdivided into encapsulated and non-encapsulated. The encapsulated ones, they have a, a connective tissue capsule of dense irregular connective tissue, uh, like the lymph nodes, uh, like the uh, spleen, and uh, the non-encapsulated uh, ones are the lymphatic nodules that uh, we find them in the small intestine forming the pyres patches in the terminal ileum, um, in the uh, appendix, uh, and also in the uh, tonsils um, that are present in the uh, pharynx. These are not covered by um, a capsule of connective tissue, but they are covered by mucous membrane epithelium, as we will see uh, shortly. Now let's start with the, the thymus. The thymus is a primary lymphatic organ. It is a lobulated organ uh, invested by a connective tissue capsule, a capsule of dense irregular connective tissue. And from the capsule, it sends uh, interlobular septa that divide the uh, organ into lobules. And it is through these interlobular septa that the blood vessels uh, reach the substance of the uh, thymus. The thymus is the place for the development and maturation of T lymphocytes from the lymphocytes that are derived from the bone marrow, red bone marrow, and um, here in the uh, thymus development uh, of immunological self-tolerance takes place. The thymus is also considered as an endocrine gland because the reticular epithelial cells that are present in the parenchyma of the gland, they secrete hormones that are uh, required for the uh, cell maturation uh, of the uh, T cells in the uh, thymus and in the uh, fetal life, it is a hemopoietic organ. If you look at the thymus in this section, you can see again the interlobular septa. You can see also in each lobule, there is a medulla and a darkly staining cortex. Here again, you can see the lighter staining medulla and a darkly staining uh, cortex. The cortex is highly packed with lymphocytes, which are undergoing development, while the uh, inner pale staining medulla has fewer lymphocytes. In fact, the medulla forms a continuous core that is covered by the cortex. An important thing to notice here is that in the cortex, there are no nodules, no lymphatic nodules, as we will see uh, them in the uh, lymph node. Here again, you can see the darkly staining cortex and lighter staining medulla. These are blood vessels in the interlobular septa and in the cortex, the immature T lymphocytes are located. These are most of the cells, they are called thymocytes and uh, they uh, migrate from the red bone marrow, as I said, and the clones of these uh, T cells are uh, produced by cell divisions, and they are pushed as they mature, they are pushed toward the medulla so that they leave through the blood vessel or through a lymphatic vessel, an efferent lymphatic vessel. Also in the cortex, there are epithelial reticular cells. You can see these cells, they have cell body and multiple processes, as you can see them here in this diagram. These produce the thymic hormones, hence the thymus is also an endocrine gland. They aid in uh, T cell maturation, like nursing the 
the T cells. These are the clones of the T cells are located in between them. And uh, they form a stromal meshwork for uh, support. In addition to that, they participate in the formation of the blood thymus barrier. You can see here, there is a capillary and uh, some of the processes are wrapped uh, around or they in sheath, they form sheaths around the blood vessels creating the um, barrier uh, to the entry of antigenic material into the thymic uh, parenchyma. In addition to that, you can see in the cortex there are large cells here. These are the macrophages. In the medulla, you can see that the cells are separated from each other. It is less densely packed. And so you can see in some places, you can see these processes of the epithelial reticular cells, which are also present in the medulla, not only present in the uh, cortex. These fine cytoplasmic extension of the thymic epithelial uh, cells. This is another section uh, showing the cortex and medulla, but here the medulla clearly shows these structures which are uh, uh, very characteristic for the medulla of the thymus. These are called the thymic corpuscles or the lamellated corpuscles or the uh, Hassel's corpuscles. They are clusters of concentric layers of dead cells. Of course, these are located in addition to the mature T cells which are going to leave via the blood. During their development, the lymphocytes that recognize self-antigens are eliminated before leaving the thymus. And this results in what we call immunologic self-tolerance. Returning back to the Hassel's corpuscles, this is the particular feature of the thymus. You can see them here, concentric arrangement. Here it is the arrangement is the concentric arrangement is a clear but also you can see that there are debris of uh, dead uh, cells these Hassel's corpuscles they appear in uh, fetal life they increase in number thereafter initially they begin as uh, medullary epithelial cells which enlarge and then degenerate it form a vac vacuolated eosinophilic mass uh, into which the lymphocytes with debris uh, dying cells which uh, were uh, sensitized against the self. That's to say that they did not develop immunologic tolerance. They are uh, dumped here. Actually, the function of these uh, thymic corpuscles is not clear, but this is probably one of the functions is that it is a dumping place for the faulty lymphocytes as they mature. During puberty, the thymus undergoes involution and is largely replaced by fatty tissue. So this is an adult thymus. You can see that although it undergoes involution, but there is still evidence of thymic tissue and the thymus is still functional even in adult life. Now let's deal with another lymphatic organ. It's a lymph node, and this is a secondary lymphatic organ where immune responses are uh, initiated. It is encapsulated, as you can see here, the capsule of dense irregular connective tissue, and also surrounded by fat in many places. From the capsule, trabeculae uh, enter into the lymph node and uh, divide the node into compartments, as you can see here in this diagram. In addition to that, there are reticular uh, fibers, and these, they form a supporting network. These are reticular fibers, not reticular epithelial cells like the ones that are present in the uh, thymus. These are reticular fibers, kind of connective tissue fibers, like the collagen, elastic fibers, and the reticular fibers. Now, the parenchyma of the uh, lymph node, which is the functional tissue, has a region here, which is called the outer cortex. It is darkly staining, like the one in the thymus, but it is characterized in the lymph node by the presence of these lymphoid follicles. And these are aggregates of B cells. And many of them, they have a center that is uh, lighter stained, and it's called the germinal center. And the follicle as a whole is called the secondary follicle. They contain macrophages as well as 
uh, proliferating B cells. These activated B cells in the germinal center, they have more cytoplasm, and so the germinal center is less densely populated with the cells, and hence it appears as a lighter stain. So we have a cortex that is divided into an outer cortex, and then there is a region here which is called the inner cortex. In the inner cortex, there are no lymphatic nodules, but there are T lymphocytes. The T lymphocytes, they proliferate, they multiply, they do not mature, they multiply, as well as uh, there are uh, some dendritic cells, which are antigen uh, presenting cells that are present in um, um, multiple locations in the body. These uh, dendritic cells, in fact, are present in the outer cortex and in the inner cortex. And then we have the central region here, which is the medulla. And the medulla is in two parts. It consists of uh, medullary cords, and these are extensions of the cortex into the medulla. And again, they contain B cells, plasma cells, and macrophages, as well as medullary sinuses. You can see here, these are medullary sinuses, which are actually a network or a plexus of interconnected uh, lymphatic uh, channels that are going to collect and form an efferent lymphatic vessel. Here again, this is another section of a lymph node. You can see the surrounding fatty tissue, like for example, uh, probably this is from a lymph node in the axilla where there is a lot of fat in the axilla. And you can see clearly here in this section how the medullary cords are extending into the medulla. And these are the medullary sinuses, the lighter staining medullary sinuses. The function of the lymph node is that it acts as a filter for lymph. So how does this take place? It takes place because it has multiple afferent lymphatic vessels. You can see here, this is a vessel. This is another vessel. The vessel here is showing even, it's showing a, a valve, uh, which prevents backflow of lymph. So multiple lymphatic vessels are coming from the periphery. And there is here at the hilum, um, there are multiple profiles of uh, vessels. Some of them are blood vessels, the ones with thicker wall, and uh, one or two are with thinner walls, and they form efferent lymphatic vessels. So multiple afferent lymphatic vessels, and one or two efferent lymphatic vessels. Here, this is a higher magnification of an afferent lymphatic vessel, showing the presence of the valve. And uh, as the lymph is flowing through the lymph node, the lymphocytes are exposed to antigens in the lymph as it flows through the node. So the lymph will go through a subcapsular sinus and then a trabecular sinus until it reaches the medullary sinus and then leaves through the efferent lymphatic vessel. Here again, a subcapsular sinus below the capsule, a trabecular sinus, a medullary sinus, and then it leaves it through an efferent lymphatic vessel. Now let's deal with another lymphatic uh, organ, uh, which is an encapsulated secondary lymphatic organ. This is the spleen. Uh, the spleen again has a stroma of connective tissue, capsule with multiple uh, trabeculae. And within the substance of the spleen, uh, there is also the, a meshwork of reticular uh, fibers, connective tissue fibers. In this uh, slide, which is stained with a special stain to show the reticular fibers as a black meshwork, as you can see it here, uh, with, within the parenchyma of the spleen, supporting the cells that are present in the spleen. The parenchyma of the spleen is in two parts. There are these rounded profiles, which constitute what we call the white pulp, because it is mainly lymphoid aggregates, white blood cells, and uh, the in-between, the red pulp, which is highly vascular. As you can see here, that there is no segregation into cortex and medulla. And so uh, this differentiates the spleen from the lymph nodes, uh, which also had lymphatic aggregates in the form of follicles, but the follicles are located in the outer cortex. They are not dispersed here uh, in the um, 
the entire thickness of the spleen. Let's go into a higher magnification of the white pulp. You can see in the white pulp here that there are aggregates of lymphocytes, macrophages, and the most important thing here that there are central arteries in the white pulp. These are called central arteries and surrounded by the lymphatic sheaths which contain T-cells organized in the form of uh, nodules. Some of them are even with a germinal center, as you can see here, proliferating and larger cytoplasm, so they are uh, lighter stained. And the peripheral ones are B lymphocytes. In the red pulp, which is highly vascular, this is the region of the red pulp between the white pulp. It is rich with macrophages, uh, plasma cells, blood cells, and lymphocytes. And in addition to that, there are a lot of sinuses, large venous sinuses. These are not lymphatic sinuses, they are venous sinuses. So here there is a kind of an open circulation. The blood uh, reaches the spleen and um, uh, the arteries divide into central arteries. And then uh, from these central arteries, capillaries will, blood will leave the capillaries into the uh, red pulp before it reaches the venous sinuses. You can see here terminal uh, capillaries, and these are the uh, venous sinuses. So in the spleen, immunological reaction takes place to antigens in the blood. In other words, the spleen acts like a filter of blood. It's not like the lymph node, which acts as a filter of lymph. Here, it acts as a filter of blood not only because there is an immunological reaction taking place to antigens in the blood, but because the worn out RBCs are removed here from the uh, spleen. Uh, these RBCs in the red pulp, they cannot easily fold to move into the uh, uh, sinusoids, into the venous sinusoids, and so they uh, will not be able to return back to the blood and they will be engulfed by the uh, macrophages that are present in the red pulp. It also acts as a blood reservoir. That's why the capsule of the spleen uh, is also con contains uh, smooth muscle fibers that contract in order to uh, push blood to the circulation or squeeze the blood to the circulation when uh, it is required. We should keep in mind that the spleen is not a vital organ, and when removed, most of its functions can be performed by uh, other organs. So far about the encapsulated lymphatic organs. Now uh, I will deal with secondary lymphatic organs that are non-encapsulated, and these are uh, located in the mucosa and submucosa of uh, GI tract, respiratory, and urogenital tract, and they are called mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue or MALT. The ones that are present in the um, submucosa and the mucosa of the gut is called GALT, gut-associated lymphoid tissue, and they provide protection against invasion by pathogens via the uh, exposed absorptive uh, surfaces. These lymphoid organs, these non-encapsulated lymphoid organs, they can be either aggregated into nodules or they can be diffuse. So let's have an example here. An aggregated lymphoid tissue. This is located in the uh, submucosa of the small intestine. This is a uh, small intestine. You can see the multiple villi. And uh, to be specific, this is the uh, ileum. And these lymphatic nodules, they might aggregate into larger and larger masses that can be seen by the uh, naked eye, especially in the terminal ileum, and are called the pyres patches. Another example of the gout is located in the appendix. This is a section of the appendix. You can see the mucosa, the submucosa, and the muscularis layer. And this is a higher magnification in the mucosa here, and this is the submucosa. You can see a lymphoid nodule, even with a germinal center in the submucosa. And this is large intestine because I can see crypts, uh, but there are no villi. Uh, this is another place where there is an aggregated 
uh, non-encapsulated lymphoid tissue. There is no connective tissue capsule surrounding the uh, lymphoid aggregates. The other place is in the palatine tonsil. You can see here that this tonsil is covered by epithelium. Look at it in higher magnification. It is stratified squamous epithelium and it is non-keratinized, the stratified squamous epithelium, like the one lining the mouth, the pharynx, the palate. And uh, you can see that there are multiple crypts. These are the nodules with germinal centers. So this is a palatine tonsil, which is characterized by these crypts. Another place where they are present in the uh, oropharynx is these lymphoid uh, nodules that are present on the posterior third of the tongue. You can see here the uh, tongue is uh, covered by stratified uh, squamous non-keratinized uh, epithelium. And uh, we can say that this is the tongue because there are multiple bundles here of uh, muscle fibers, not very clear. Uh, but also I can see here that um, beneath the epithelium, there are collection of acini, mucus acini of accessory salivary glands. So this is a lingual tonsil that is present in the posterior third of the tongue. The lingual tonsil together with the palatine tonsil, together with the adenoid or the pharyngeal tonsil, together with the tubal tonsil, they constitute a ring at the beginning of the upper respiratory and digestive passages, which is called the Valdir's ring. This is an example of diffuse lymphoid tissue that is present in the mucosa here. This is a section in the esophagus. You can see the stratified squamous epithelium, non-keratinized, and these cells, they are lymphocytes and plasma cells. They are diffuse in the mucosa. And another example here of diffuse lymphoid tissue as the alveolar macrophages that are present in the alveoli uh, of the lung and this alveolar uh, septum. You can see they are darkly staining because uh, these macrophages, they have uh, engulfed the particulate matter, which uh, is uh, like uh, dust cells, carbon particles, or the, sometimes they phagocytize uh, red blood cells that may enter the alveoli and uh, heart uh, failure, as well as their main function, which is to phagocytize infectious organisms. Thank you.